Hi everyone, I'm Brad Campbell. Today, I really wanted to post this podcast video that I did. Um, Patrick Fransco from Window Film Pros, he and I have known each other for years. He asked me to be on his podcast and it was a real fun experience for me and a real honor to be on there. And uh, he is allowing me to post that interview here on my YouTube channel. Hope you enjoy it and uh, I'll see you again soon. Hey everybody, it's Patrick Fransco with our latest uh, podcast coming to you today, and I'm really excited about the guest that I have on today. I think you guys are all going to really appreciate him. Some of you may not know who this is, so I like to refer to him as the silent assassin because he's built an incredibly successful business and somewhat done it without a lot of people understanding how big he's actually grown his business. So, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Brad Campbell from Campbell Window Film to the podcast. Thank you, Patrick. It's great to be here. Great. Well, hey, one of the things, because a lot of the people on the podcast might not be aware of who you are or the history of your business, I thought we'd start right out with if you could give us kind of a, a little bit of an overview of your journey of like how you got started in the business and, you know, all the way up to where you are now. Yeah. Well, I started out in North Carolina working through high school at a dealership for a car dealership and I, tinting was just barely beginning to show up on some of the cars and I was a little bit intrigued by it but I was doing a lot of auto detailing uh, used car lot prep and uh, when I finally moved out here I moved to California actually as a musician and uh, I moved out here in my van with That's my brother awesome. ended up living in my van drummer if I remember yeah, correctly drummer, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it was, it, it's been a little bit of a rags to riches story, you know, but uh, I had to, um, I had two things that I really liked. One was music and one was cars. So as I was fighting my way through the music business and I did okay in music business, recorded records, shared the stage with a lot of big name acts, but I could see that it wasn't, it wasn't the financial security and the longevity that I needed. So I said, well, I'm going to learn something in the automotive business uh, so that I can do two things that I like, music and automotive. And I found a guy that taught me how to tank cars and just started doing that out of the back of my van, same van I was hauling my drums in. Wow. Okay. So now, how long was it uh, before you had said you, somebody w had shown you how to start tending cars? How long were you in that position before you decided to, like, I'm going to open my own business or I'm going to start Campbell? Or how? what kind of time frame was that? I think I worked there and kind of honed the craft for about two years, two or three years. Um, and this was strictly automotive. You weren't really at that time doing any flat. I was doing lines. both. Okay. I was doing both. Uh, uh, you know, you learn automotive and you become really, really good at all the little details and it makes flat glass really easy. So it wasn't long before I was on flat glass jobs. Okay. But, uh, you know, I noticed that the customer service in the industry was really kind of low. Uh, you know, we were getting the job done. I know I was doing my part really well, and I'd really take my time in the house to put down blankets and offer that customer service, the smile and all that. But I noticed that coming back from the office and you know, I was hearing a lot of complaints from the customers about, you know, the communication being poor. And so I thought, well, there's a big need. There's a big opportunity in this business to really be the leader in customer service. And that, that's really where our core philosophy has come from and has always been. And, you know, it works very well. So uh, now you've started a business. What year roughly, or is this when you actually started, what would is now Campbell Window Film? I moved to California in March of 1988. I uh, lived in my van for probably six months, working menial jobs. I had the worst kind of jobs, man. I had no support system out here. Uh, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any financial help. Uh, I had to get a job working out of my van in order to have enough money and, and a paycheck to be able to rent an apartment. But all the while, you know, I was doing some detailing, car detailing. That's one thing that I knew. I was doing that on the side. And uh, so, yeah, it's been pretty much 30 years. Wow. So when you when you got into the business, um, I mean, obviously, we still I think a lot of us talk about how window film is still scratching the surface of what's possible. But you go back 30 years ago and it was a pretty rudimentary industry compared to what it is now from a technology standpoint of the films and even some of the techniques or even how it's received as far as from the general public. Um, but one of the things I want to get into and, I'll, you know, is the next season uh, 
comes into you know Campbell is I've always felt that you you've been on the front end of really understanding what window film can be and presenting it to your consumers in a way that's different than maybe what's been traditionally how window film has been taken to the market. So I know, you know, kind of fast forward a little bit to I've known you about 10 years and I know I was impressed when we first met that I'd been in the industry for when we met probably going on close to 10 years. And I was very impressed with how you approach the business because it was slightly different than anybody else I'd ever met before. Clearly, somebody is coming from outside the business, but I, I don't want to step up. But I mean, it'd be great to have you kind of overview that. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's real easy in, in our, within our industry to sort of get get stuck in the in the, in the thinking of the group think, and uh, you know, so I always look at other industries and figure out how we might be able to introduce some of those concepts into window film. And a lot of it is in marketing, is presenting. The, this is a weird product. You know, it's clear almost, uh, well, not with automotive, but we don't do automotive anymore, as you know. Yeah. So when you're when you're working with buildings, it's not something that's going to make a real noticeable change to the property. So we have to sell it in a way that people are going to really understand that you're not, you're not getting something that you can necessarily see, but the benefits are, mm-hmm. you know, tenfold behind the scenes. So I think I've always just approached it looking at other businesses and, and thinking of ways that we could stand out from the crowd and the way that we present our products. And, uh, you know, we've done that, I think, okay, pretty well. I think so. And I I think, again, the idea, I I like what you said about groupthink, because I think it's true. We sort of, we become insular and we start to look within the industry of what, what other people are doing that's successful. And one of the things I think you had hit on is you actually looked outside the industry. You weren't looking at other successful window film companies and saying, how can I emulate them? You were looking, if I remember 10 years ago, there was a mattress company in Southern California. I remember us talking about 10 years ago that was doing some really innovative marketing things. And I remember us having conversations about, man, it'd be kind of cool to integrate some of that into what we do in window film. So to your point, I mean, I think you were looking not at emulating the big guys within the window film industry, but who are the people that are really just doing business well and customer service well? And how can I then take some of those concepts and bring them into the industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always felt that the the window film industry could be much larger than it actually is, but it, it just hasn't I um, caught the interest of the right person yet uh, to take it there. And so I've always tried to look at things from a perspective of if I were on the outside of this industry looking in, how would I perceive it? And, and even in my own business, I think, you know, you drive by, past a business time and time again, day after day on your way home. And you look at these businesses and think, um, what would my business be? How would it be perceived if I drove by and there was a big sign on there that said under new management? How would they take an existing business and then supercharge it, make it so much better than it currently is? So I'm the current owner. I should be asking myself, I should be taking myself to task under those same, under that same perspective. And someone is going to come in and be uh, a disruptor in the window film industry. There's too much potential that is not even being close to being met. And it's probably because we're kind of cycling through all the same ideas over and over again. So we need to inject new thought processes and ideas into this industry to get it to really move. And of course, I'd love to be the thought leader and to be able to to uh, sort of fast track our, our uh, trajectory. Why not? Well, that kind of takes me to the next thing I wanted to talk about. Just recently, you've launched a, a video series that I think has been pretty interesting. If, and uh, I'll... In this podcast, I'll link up uh, some links to to Brad's new um, video series. But what was your motivation behind that? Because it seems like some of that it's sort of dovetailing with what we're talking about right now. So, yeah. Well, I mean, when I moved to California, I remember I was I was here to be a musician. I saw myself somehow making a difference on the world stage. Uh, I thought it would be in music, but you know, the universe has a sense of humor. And here I am in the window film of all things. But you know, I like it here. It's a strange little industry. It's like a black hole, as you know, you and I have been both in here for a long time. And a lot of people never leave window film. It's profitable, it's good business. But I think that I've always had this desire to be creative. Uh, I need to really exercise the conservative left brain and the artistic right brain uh, simultaneously in business. So I love to build and create things. And so part of that was how am I going to merge my artistic desires 
um, into my business because I could go be an artist off time and it's really going to detract from my business and then only be in business sort of clocking in nine to five. But I don't want that. I want the success in business as well. So I've got to take the artistic side and merge it into the business somehow. And that's going to be through the creative process. So with photography and video, uh, I can exercise that. And while I'm always not doing video and photography of the things that I really would like to be doing, maybe down in a shipyard somewhere or flying overseas and going in the jungle, I do it here in business. And I, and I get that, that instant gratification from that artistic freedom. And I'm just trying to parlay that into something that would be useful for the business. So the videos kind of came, you know, as just a need, as an outlet, really. Okay. Creativity. But I think there's two different channels. One is um, my personal YouTube channel, uh, YouTube forward slash C forward slash Brad Campbell. And that is more my entrepreneur, uh, my entrepreneurial uh, meanderings, yeah. my humble beginnings and how I got here. And then there's the uh, the Campbell Window Film YouTube page, which is more uh, an educational type. And I'm trying to keep it non-biased. I'm trying not to necessarily just promote my company sure. or 3M, which is our partner in manufacturing, our primary partner in manufacturing. Um, I'm really just trying to promote the industry as a whole. And I think there's a real need in our industry for people to really try to promote the industry. You know, we're not competitors necessarily amongst one another here in the industry. Our competition is the glass industry. Yeah. Our competition is the status quo, people that do nothing or that don't know about window film. Yeah. So the vast potential, I think, is from those that have no idea what window film is or still think it's bubbly stuff on cars. And we've got to get the word out there, and it will grow the industry. I, I agree 100%, obviously. I know you were one of the early supporters of what we're doing with the Window Film Pros consumer page. And I sometimes feel like, you know, you're throwing buckets of water on an inferno. The, the need is so great to educate consumers. And I applaud your effort to kind of start doing some stuff, too. And it's, again, I agree with you that it's not competition. It's literally like such a small percentage of the people out there understand what window film is and what it can do. Literally, if as an industry, if we can understand that if we can just move that needle and it doesn't even have mm -hmm. to move that far, our industry can double in size because it's so it's, I would say, and, I, and I'll actually be aggressive, but if you go out and just randomly talk to a hundred people, I'd be surprised if five people understand what that. the product we should yeah. do that. We should go be being exactly. on the street and ask people what they think of window film or did they know what it is? Exactly. I think maybe somebody did that already, did they? I think some people, I know that IWFA shot a video up in LA a couple of years ago and things like that, but I would be surprised if it's even five. So to me, that tells me, and you know, not everybody's going to need the product, but I think in general, people just aren't aware of it. So anything we as an industry can do, and you know, we're trying to do you know the little bit with Window Film Pros and the the consumer awareness. You're doing your videos. I think it just raises consumer awareness, and I think that people getting the word out there so that people understand what what Window Film can do. It's actually a, a for what it is. It's actually a pretty impressive product. Pretty I mean, cool. it's. Yeah. It, it's one of the products out there that you don't have to put a marketing spin on it because it actually does what we say that it does. It actually yeah. truly does what it. I've always really liked this industry because I be, I truly believe in what it what it can do. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's a very useful product, yeah. you know, and and it, it it works. And I cannot sell something that I don't believe in. And so I think the reason one of the reasons why I've stuck in this industry for so long is because I, I see that it, it does good things. It saves a lot of energy. It's certainly canceling out my carbon footprint. And yeah. my entire families, yeah. you know, what we do on a large commercial building is to probably cancel out my whole generation's worth of uh, carbon footprint. So um, it, it is a good product. But I, th I like to say, you know, we need to go out and get our own uh, market. Go grab your own market, you know, and, and uh, we get competitive in our little towns fighting against each other over, you know, Mrs. Jones house. But there's a hundred houses out there that are ripe for the picking and you just got to go educate those people. Yeah, I agree with you. One of the things I wanted to move into now that I know I've been impressed uh, when when I first started coming to your business back when you were even at the old location was you've always been very successful getting really high quality people working for you and not only getting them to work for you, but, you know, um, some of the people that have been working for you the entire 10 years I've known you, they're mm -hmm. still they're still employees here. So. 
What would you say, I guess, some of the things you've learned or some of the mistakes you've made that you've learned from? Because clearly you, you've you had, you know, obviously there's probably been some bad ex- examples in there as well, but you've clearly been able to really find some quality people and then keep them. And that seems to be something in this industry. If we're going to grow, that's a critical part of it. You yeah. can't grow without the right people in place. So, And I think that's that's occurring uh, naturally in this industry as, as the industry matures and you're getting uh, stronger players coming in. People are realizing how important uh you know, productivity and personnel are. So we need to make, not only do we need to have good employees, but they need to be happy and excited about their careers with us so that they're going to be really, you know, outputting as much as possible in the time that they are here. So we're looking at other industries again, modeling after some of those that are, have a little bit more, better funding to do research, find out what it is that's motivating their employees and how are they maintaining retention the way that they do. But you're right. I've got uh, my esteemed colleague, um, Nora's been here for 16 years, and um, we've got several that are over 10 years. Yeah. And I think uh, I just, you know, I think I'm not in it really as much for the money as I am just to build something mm-hmm. and the whole legacy behind uh, building something. And, and I look at my company, I look at all the mouths that we feed, you know, not just the direct employee, but their family and all the benefits that they can bring to their family. That gives me a, an enormous sense of gratitude. That really is what gets me out of bed. The money's cool, you know, and of course we're all trying to uh, up our game yeah. uh, professionally. But I think really the people element of it, especially in a service-based industry, is, cannot be underestimated. Well, I think that you hit one of the things you hit on, and I've I've thought that for a while is, and it's a hundred percent accurate what you said. Your business from a at some point in time you grow your business to a size where your income is what it needs to be to support your lifestyle. And then the question becomes, okay, you know, w- what's the motivation to take it to the next level? Cause yeah, you, you can only have, you know, you know, you're only going to buy such a nice watch or such mm-hmm. a, you know, once you get in the house, you're comfortable with, you're driving a car, you're comfortable with, you have the watch you want at some point in time, you know, it's a, uh, you know, I'm an economics major from college. So you know, the law of diminishing returns. Mm-hmm. I mean, you yeah. know, well, a great example of yeah. that, and this is probably dating me a little bit, but uh, back in the Napster trials, when Metallica was really on the forefront of fighting against Napster, and Lars Ulrich said, you know, the drummer of Metallica said, uh, you know, I'm not doing this because I need the money. The pool is heated. My yeah. house. I'm doing this because I want future generations of musicians to have the same opportunity to go grassroots from the yeah. garage to superstardom the way that I did, and Napster's undoing that. And I just thought that was a really cool thing. And I've used that quote a lot, you know. So for me, too, the pool is heated. And I could probably just cruise this on out, you know, from here. Sure. But uh, I want to grow it, not just for me, but because I want that opportunity to be there for my employees. And they are relying on me to continue to grow the business. That's awesome. Um, kind of a shift there. Obviously, in the last couple years, you've actually expanded into some parallel industries, I would say, that are complementary to window film. But uh, slightly in a different lane. And obviously, uh, do you, I, I would like you to kind of, because in, in this business, you've expanded into a couple parallel areas. It might be a little different than some other people have. But even if you, in the automotive segment, there's the challenge of, do I get into wraps? And mm-hmm. do, do I get into paint protection film? And when you approach those decisions, it's always interesting to me of like, you know, the, the one set of wisdom is, you know, stay in your lane, do what you do better than anybody else. And then there's the, okay, I'm expanding into other lanes and the pros and cons of being the best window film company you could be versus saying, okay, we're going to do window film and we're going to do a couple other segments. Yeah. I think the reason why we got into the parallel uh, verticals was because we were getting asked so much about those verticals and we're referring tons and tons of business to, to our friends that do the same thing. And then we realized, you know, we, we, We've been doing this for so long with them that we're becoming experts at it. We should do it ourselves. Um, partly it was that, but I mean, you're right. You do have to keep circling back to your core DNA and making sure you're tip top over there. You know, and so we do. We meander back and forth. My staff laughs because my head is on a swivel. Every little shiny thing is uh, intriguing to me and I want to go chase it. Yep. And I have to put the, you know, the mule blinders on to keep focused. Um, but we do very slowly experiment 
in these uh, little parallel verticals. And then if, if there's gold in that vein, then we keep digging. If there's not, you know, I like to say if, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Uh, hit the That's hardest part advice. of that. Hit the hardest part of that first. And if you can't get over that hurdle, then don't waste your time with all the easy stuff. And then only to get to the hard part to find out the door is locked and you can't get in. Hit that hard part first. If you can break through that barrier, then go for it. So do you guys have like a system when you look at a new product where you say, do you guys go into it with a very defined game plan to say, this is what it's going to look like. And we're going to measure, you know, we're going to spend some time really measuring to where we know whether there's goal, like mm-hmm. and do you, how much, you know, without obviously every, every situation is probably a little bit different, but how much time do you give yourself to figure out whether you're one shovel away from yeah. hitting the vein of gold or this isn't working, I'm going to pull the plug. Well, I think so much of it we've done, uh, like I said, with, with refer, we're referring it out to other people. So we knew there was money there. We knew there yeah. was a lot of demand there. And uh, we just didn't necessarily have all the expertise. So we needed to either hire or buy the equipment, uh, whatever the case was. But, um, yeah, I think we're, we're, I'm very cautious in that regard, very conservative. I, I, I never want to get too big for my britches, as my dad used to say. Um, so we move cautiously. And you and I were talking earlier about yeah. uh, being very cautious about expansion. Yeah. And waiting until you're literally splitting at the seams before you, you make a big, bold move, like maybe buying a building or moving into a bigger space. Well, that's actually it leads right in, because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is every entrepreneur, every business owner has to face the question of if their business is going well, when to expand and when to make that decision. And I think, you know, some people spend ahead of the curve. They, you know, they'll they'll hire employees before they have the business in hopes that that's going to stimulate the business and other other people tend to wait until to your point they're bursting at the seams and i i think we were we were having a conversation but as a business owner as you have approached that in a business that's you've in the 10 years i've known you you've been on a steady steep growth curve you guys have grown tremendously in those 10 years how have you approached that decision making uh, as far as when you bring on that next employee when you buy that next truck when you, you know. Yeah, I think it depends on a lot of factors. And so we, we take those steps, you know, in the moment based on all the factors involved, you know, the economy and, uh, uh, you know, just all the, you know, there's destructive technology to keep an eye out for. So you don't want to end up way out overextended and then realize that that was a big mistake because it's very hard and expensive to, to come back. So I think we've always taken it. But you know, as far as moving into a bigger space, um, we've been very cautious and we've always tried to run real lean, you know, uh, more work, fewer people, more efficient, that whole thing. But uh, as far as like infrastructure, buying vans and trucks like that, we don't really hold back in hiring. If the economy is good, business is good, the outlook is good based on all the factors and you never know, the bottom could fall out. But, you know, we just go based on, you know, history. Yep. Things seem like they're going well. We'll, we'll start hiring. Uh, we we always hire in the winter. Start training because when you know when the tsunami hits, you've you know you're going to lose a lot of business. So you have the potential to actually shoot yourself in the foot by not hiring early. You're actually not the first successful person in this business or other businesses, but specifically in this business, uh, I've talked to a couple people. I think Chris Robinson on a previous podcast mentioned the same thing, like we hire in the winter when everybody else is trying to cut, like there's a lot of good quality people out there. And I'm like, he's, you know, Chris, and it sounds like you're thinking the same thing. Like, you know, May is going to come yeah, and I'm going to hire these people that are a players in January when, you know, who they're working for doesn't have work for them because even if I have to carry them for a couple of months, it's going to pay off in spades in May, June, July, August when, yeah. Well, yeah, and you're not you're not going to have a trained. Well, as far as installers go, you're not going to have a trained uh, journeyman installer in a few months. But what you will have is an apprentice that's um, helping your journeyman prep the job site. You know, he's the first to load in, and he's the first to load everything out. And those guys can be very useful and add two to three jobs to that crew's day. Yeah. So they can, even though they're not a trained uh, installer, they can really add a lot of work to your docket through efficiencies. So I think that's the way we've always looked at it. And then if uh, the year remains good and you can keep them on all through the next winter, then they just keep getting better every year. 
I got a quite one of the things I try to do with the podcast is have like at least uh, one part of it where we focus on something really practical. And I know from your background coming up, you know, living in the van and starting this from scratch, what would you say if somebody's on a tighter budget? Maybe they just launched their business in the last couple of years and and they're really struggling to even you know sometimes just cover all the costs they have associated. What would you say for somebody on a budget that you found? And I know you you also do a lot of forward thinking marketing things. So what one of the things I'm thinking about is like that you found that has actually yielded without a tremendous amount of cost, but yielded a lot of traction and a lot of benefit. Because obviously, as you started, sometimes you didn't have the huge mm-hmm. marketing budget, but you still had to figure out a way to make yeah. you know the sales come in. So what well, have you found to be a classic example? Would be um, when I was oh gosh, this is this is a lot of years ago, but we had a big downturn in the economy, stock stock market. I'm sorry, the dot-com bubble burst. I think it was 1997, somewhere around there. And not only that, but we had El Nino here in Southern California. So I had just got my own place, had moved out from roommates, and was running this business. It was a very small business at that time. And the fo- I was busy, but the phone was beginning to get quiet, and it was raining. And I knew, man, I better do something. you got to keep pounding the pavement. I tell my sales guys this all the time. When you're busy... That's the time to be knocking on doors. You got to shoehorn that into your schedule because you don't want to wait until the phone's dead and then you start running around trying to get business, okay? Because it's going to be a day late, dollar short. You're going to run out of, you're not going to get rent money. So I would just really, I was super paranoid. Once you've been poor, you never want to be poor again. So yeah. you're going to really make sure you're putting in a lot of extra effort. And I would just go around and uh, talk to business owners. Drive around town every day. I'd stop into two or three businesses, uh, get people my cards, uh, go to networking meetings, busting the hump, grinding, you know. It's one of the things I, I mean, it's it's interesting when you talk to people that have like really over a number of years been um, successful. It's typically not there's not some silver bullet out there. It comes down when you distill it all down to the people that tend to really have a lot of success over an extended period of time. Because let's face it, right now we're in a we're in an eight year stretch of pretty good times. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to run into another situation where the world for a couple of years melts and. The, the the you know the the businesses that aren't doing what, like you said it, it you know and that doesn't mean we're gonna have another 2008 but you know it's not been hard over the last eight years to have yeah. a level of success it's who sustains for 30 years your business and some other ones that I've talked yeah. to and it comes down to when you really talk to people it's just the, the willingness to go out and grind uh, and just yeah. grind. I'm never comfortable. You know, you cannot get complacent. Even in the best of times when I feel like we're on top of the world, I'm not complacent. I have this innate paranoia that something's going to go wrong. You know, be prepared or be scared because yeah. we might have another 2008, you know, and you, you better be ready for it. You better have a backup plan. Well, one of the things, and I know we're, we're getting into the podcast and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but to that point, and I appreciate what you're saying about the paranoia, but at least from the outside, I, I envy the work-life balance you seem to have been, especially in the last, again, I've known you about 10 years, but it seems like in about the last three years, you have really seemed to catch a sweet spot of, you know, working really hard, but also enjoying the time away from work. And what what caused that to change because clearly about three years ago is when I noticed that it was like, but your business has continued to grow and and be successful, but you clearly also enjoy your time away from the business as well. Yeah, I think there's just a lot of factors there. Um, you know, one, I met Maggie. Yeah. You know, she's just a, such a great partner and she allows me to be who I am. And, and uh, we're kind of loners. To be quite frank, that's probably largely where that illusion comes yeah. from. Uh, we don't spend tons of time hanging out with friends. I, you know, I don't go to football games. I don't care about that kind of stuff. So a lot of the, our spare time is uh, out in the middle of nowhere in our Jeep. Cell phones are, have fallen down between the seats somewhere. We don't care. We can't find them. It doesn't matter. Don't have reception anyway. Uh, but I've got my camera. I've got my dog. And I've got my significant other. And I'm, uh, I'm in my element. And I take a lot of photos and then I love editing. Yeah. And so the video and the photo editing and all that, man, is it's like, a, it's like meditation to me. So I, you know, I think that's where it comes from. 
Well, that's, I mean, and again, it's, it's, it's great. Cause again, there's part of it that I, I think the it's, it's dovetailing those things, the important, the importance of grinding and being willing to like, Hey, I'm never too, I'm never too big for my britches to go and knock on that next door and try to make that sale. But then also understanding that if I'm happy as a human being, that's going to translate to every other area of my life, including the business success. Cause a lot of people I think feel like the paranoid part of it takes over and, and they end up like, working themselves to death and then they're not even enjoying what they're doing anymore and then their business even though they're working really really hard at their business their business starts to slip and it's not because they're not working hard but they're not enjoying what they do anymore yeah and, it's, a, it's like your um your your palate gets numb and you can't you can't really differentiate between uh what's what's really good and what's not and i think that's a dangerous place to be in you've got to reset man yeah you know and i think it, when you do that you your senses uh, perk back up again, and you'll make better choices. So I'll just end with this last question, and I'll let you take a take us out. Uh, as you look at the industry, and uh, you know uh, the next five years, the next you know twelve months, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in the industry, and what would you say you you feel like is the um, not the pie in the sky stuff that we all may talk about, but the practical things that you would say, hey. These are the attainable things that are very practical that anybody in the industry can be striving towards. It's going to make a big impact in the next 12 months to 60 months. Uh, so it's not too much like, hey, this is where we can be in 10 years. This is where you can be 12 months from now. Well, I, I don't know that there's anything really fundamentally changing about, uh, you know, window film as far as its energy efficiency property or its ability to stop fading. I mean, I think the technology is kind of, I won't say it's plateaued. We have really interesting products like better low E films and things, but they're not moving the needle that dramatically. I think really our outlook comes more from the outreach. I think that there's a huge untapped market out there. And I think more it's about educating people that are unaware of all the benefits of window film. And that's always been the big challenge in this industry is awareness. So uh, we're just on an educational awareness campaign. And I think we're doing that in our and I think I would like for anyone listening to join me in that effort to get out to educate people through maybe less traditional ways, not just running ads, but getting out, doing speaking engagements, um, you know, videos, podcasts, all yeah. of this. And what you're doing, Patrick, I think is fantastic. This You've really sort of dedicated a portion of your time and energy to the industry to give back. And I think you're probably experiencing some of what I am. If you want to leave a legacy, yeah. there's some things that are more important than the money. And giving back to this industry that's given so much to you is important, and I think you're doing a great job. Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate you sp taking the time to be on the podcast today, and I, I, I really think that a lot of people will benefit from this uh, as far as some of the insight that you've given them. I do want to, uh, and I'll make sure I link it up in the actual page, but uh, do you want to give your uh, the channel the trend that you have? Because I'd like some of the people to check that out. Because, again, I think they could actually use those videos, even if they feel like, hey, man, this isn't my thing to get in front of the camera or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the way you're doing them allows them to take those and yeah. use them right in their market. Yeah. And even though our tag out is Campbell, you know, uh, if you're not in California, that's not going to mean a lot to your customers. So you could use this. I would encourage people to feel free to use the content. Um, just Google, I'm sorry, uh, go into the YouTube search and just type in Campbell, like the soup, window yeah. film, and we'll pop right up. And and a lot of these are, uh, yeah, they're, they're designed not to be brand specific or they're not designed. They're just an educational uh, effort so the customers can watch that and not feel like they're being sold something. Exactly. And just learn about the product. And so, uh, yeah, I'd love for you guys to join uh the, my subscriber list. We have a 300 subscribers. I'm thrilled. I'd love to see that 30,000 or 100,000. I don't know if this industry can attract that kind of audience, but please do hit the subscribe button and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you out there in video land. All right. Thanks, Brad. Great having you on. Thanks, Patrick. Okay. So there you have it. My first podcast ever. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I know I certainly did. And I'd like to thank Patrick Fransco and Window Film Pros for giving me the opportunity to be on your podcast. Thanks a lot.